um, give an amazing treat uh, in store for you. Uh, this session explores the relationship between African American history and film, whether implicitly or explicitly. And it gives me very great pleasure to introduce two very special guests, the celebrated filmmaker <laughs> Sam Pollard, um, our, our friend and a celebrity uh, uh, filmmaker, in conversation with our esteemed colleague, uh, Paula Masood of the film department. Uh, Sam Pollard uh, is an Emmy award-winning filmmaker um, who brings history to life by creating really powerful images that tell true stories about the past. Uh, we talked about the importance of unvarnished truth in the, uh, last, uh, <laughs> in the last session, right? Uh, I think he does that through the medium of film. Uh, one of the films that we use quite a bit, several of us in our classes here, is Slavery by Another Name, which premiered in the, um, at the uh, uh, 2012 Sundance Film Festival. Uh, and was broadcast on PBS, and it depicts the emergence of new forms of forced labor in forced civil war in America. Um, but most recently, his acclaimed film, Two Trains Running, um, offered a many, as many reviewers as suggested, a moving portrait of American race relations through the prism of music. I just want to say, that um, Sam not only interviewed Professor Franklin, but his work embodies, many of us would argue, the activist spirit of Franklin's legacy. Franklin used history to, truth, uh, to speak truth to power, to lay bare the structures of oppression in our society. So in his hands then, history became a tool to dismantle dis uh, discrimination and to build a better society. And many of us see Sam's films in that way. Um, we see him using the medium of film to represent history in this activi uh, uh, activist way. The images that he creates explain not only the world in which we live, um, sometimes through prisms of the past, but galvanize activist visions of a better future. Um, Paula Masood, who will be in conversation with um, uh, Sam, is a professor of film studies at Brooklyn College. She is the author of Black City Cinema, African American Urban Experiences in Film, and the editor of the Spike Lee Anthology. Uh, her articles on African American cinema, the city and film, and other topics have, appeal, uh, have appeared in uh, Cinema Journal, African American Review, Literature Film Review, and a number of other uh, forums. And she's published uh, pieces in numerous anthologies. Um, she is also uh, working on a visual history of Harlem. And uh, she's taught many of us a great deal about African American history and film. So I give you Sam Pollard. I'm going to show a clip first from the, the latest film I directed, Two Trains Running, and then we'll start a conversation. I don't know where the lights are. Do you know where the lights are? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're bright. No. It's getting much brighter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Probably a few young men decided to go off in search of these legends. 
That quest brought them to Mississippi in the summer of 1964, just as another group, drawn by the civil rights movement, was also venturing south. Both would awaken America to the value of black life, but at a cost. There were two trains running that summer, and they would meet one fateful Sunday in June. February 1st, 1960. Negro students launched the movement that electrified the nation, the city. National Guard troops were moved into Oxford, Mississippi to enforce the Supreme Court edict that a Negro must be registered at the University of Mississippi. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. By 1963, Negro groups decided to make voting a major goal. When you come down into a flat, soft country of the south, you get a different kind of music. The great change is at hand. Those who do nothing are inviting change as well as violence. June 12, 1963, a sniper's bullet killed Medgar Evers. August 28, more than 200,000 people marched on Washington for jobs and freedom for Negroes. Civil Rights is now in its ninth day. The debate on the motion to take up the Civil Rights Bill is continuing as we talk. How's everybody today? Good? All right. Good. I'm so pleased. I've been looking forward to this all semester to be able to sit down and have a talk with you about your films, about your films in history, African American history, documentary filmmaking, fiction filmmaking, editing, sound editing, I don't know, everything. Um, I have a, a list of questions just in case we ran out of things to talk about. So mm -hmm. I'll start with an official question. I have a feeling that we'll just sort of go through range of the um, if that's okay with you, or I can stick to the script. How do you feel? Okay. Um, so my first question starts with a quote from Dr. Franklin. Um, my challenge was to weave into the fabric of American history enough of the presence of blacks so that the story of the United States could be told adequately and fairly. So I was hoping that you could reflect on Dr. Franklin's words with regard to your own filmmaking and your own filmmaking career. Do you see it as either a challenge or a responsibility to weave African American stories into your work in um, film? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of start back. When I, when I first got into the business, back in the early 70s, and I was an assistant editor on a feature film titled Ganja and S. It was directed by a gentleman named Bill Gunn edited by a gentleman named Peter Konevsky. And as a young man of 22, my, my, my mantra was, after that film, I didn't want to work on any black films. I wanted to be part of the American melting pot. You know, I didn't want to be a black editor. I didn't want to be an African-American editor. I just wanted to be an editor, because I wanted to be an editor. Fortunately, fortunately when I was 30, I was introduced to a gentleman named St. Clair Bourne, a wonderful African-American documentary filmmaker, 
who we were working on a documentary called Going, Going to Chicago, about the blues in Chicago. And working with Saint for that one year, that first year, Saint made me understand that as an African-American, I had a responsibility that any film I touch should be about our experience. And that was a responsibility that I had to take charge of. So from that point on, every film that I became involved with, either as an editor, later on as a filmmaker with Eyes on the Prize, my first producing job, my mantra has been, that's my responsibility, to express, to articulate, to document the African-American experience. Because to me, it's the American experience. And I understand that, I understood that from that point on, from the age of 30 on, I didn't look back. So I completely agree that what Dr. Franklin said. This is just a question. I don't know how many people have heard of Ganja in the House, but it's an amazing film that had a very troubled um, production, production distribution, yeah. exhibition, and it's recently come to light again. And so was some of the your response to that just because of the troubled nature of that film or just because you wanted to shift into... No, know, it wasn't. Project? It was growing up in America. It was growing up in this country. It was growing up watching television and seeing you know, Robert Culp or seeing Bonanza or seeing Cary Grant. It was all these white images that I saw constantly, 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 constantly that got into my head. So, you know, I wasn't, you know, even though I knew about Malcolm and Medgar, you know, and James Baldwin, it was that white fabric of America that I was, I, I had put in, brought into my DNA. It wasn't that film, it was just being in America, you know. So when you um, you have a long history um, and career in television as well, and mm -hmm. it goes back almost to the very beginning. Uh, Seventy two. So do you find that that, that um, television gave you the um, freedom to explore some of the topics that you wanted to explore um, without having potentially some of the financial um, liabilities of? Well, no, as a documentary filmmaker, anybody who's a documentary filmmaker knows that it's always a struggle to make your films to get your films funded. I think it's your film scene. It's even more, it's more of a struggle when you try to do films about people of color. You know, so it's always been a challenge. Television has been the avenue where most of my work has been seen. But, you know, it's always been a struggle. I, you know, I was very fortunate. I was in a film and television workshop that was started by public television in 1968. You know, WNET, public television station, after Dr. King's assassination, they started a workshop to get more people of color behind the camera, in the editing room, producing, doing sound. I was in their fourth class. So I was mentored by lots of African-American filmmakers, editors, directors, sound mixers, all of that. So to me, television has been this avenue for me to have my work seen, but it's always been a struggle to get it funded, to get it done, always. Do you think that um, you know, net, uh, cable channels like HBO and all have opened that up a bit as well? Or do you I mean, how do you, I mean, compared to sort of well, the PBS and public broadcasting? Well, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we have an HBO and we have a Showtime, we have an A&E, you know, you have Netflix. But the thing to remember, always to remember that, you know, it's always who's at the, up in the upper echelons, who opens those doors. So if you, if I go to Sheila Nevins, who's the president of programming at documentary for documentaries at HBO, even though she knows me, I won't get a film as easy as Alex Gibney or Barbara Koppel, you know, because they're white filmmakers, their reputation, they got great reputations. So it's still a struggle. It's still a struggle. You know, the struggle always continues. It, it's, you know, I have, a, I have a career, but it's not like it's been an easy career. I've been fortunate, but it's still a struggle, always a struggle. And you should never forget that when you're creating, when you're a person of color. It's always going to be a struggle. There was an article that came out today that was talking about Moonlight winning the, um, best picture. the best picture and how that doesn't mean that all of a sudden the floodgates are going to open up. Uh, it never means that. <laughs> so he's a slave one, best picture. It doesn't mean the floodgates open up. It never does. I mean, you saw more people of color in the Academy Awards this year than last year, but I would bet money that next year you'll see less. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you pick your subjects. Um, is it something that you, I mean, part of it is telling um, uh, African-American history or story, a component of that, but 
is it also that you see a good story and you want to go with that as well? I think that there's a narrative there that is something that you think you can do something really interesting with, or is it something that just has, you've always wanted to do, or you've met someone? It's a combination of both. I mean, I, uh, again, I've been very fortunate that I've been attached to projects that are of interest to me, you know, that I feel that I can explore and do do justice to. So when I did Slavery by Another Name, which was mentioned by Duncan, it was a book that I had read in galleys. And me and another person, we liked the book so much, we tried to option it from Doug Blackman, and he passed on us, you know, until he, he made a deal with Twin Cities Public Television, the public television station in Minnesota. And then when they were looking for a director, he, he recommended me. So that was a very fortunate connection. Yeah. But that book was so such an historically interesting and important book. I mean, this other person thought, this should be a film. This should definitely be a film. We need to do a film. I mean, when I, did, when I was fortunate to be involved with Eyes on the Prize, that history to me was invaluable, to, to, to get that history out there, to be a part of that second, the second part of Eyes on the Prize. You know, I did a film a few years ago about Venus and Serena. Now, they are phenomenal tennis players. I happen to love tennis. So it was like, there was a good match. So I'm, you know, I've been fortunate to, to, to become involved in films that I feel something about and I feel it's important history. You know, Because to me, the one thing that I, that I really liked when I was in high school is I loved history. I loved history. I loved digging into history. And I didn't know at the time that being in documentary film would be like really have an opportunity to really study history, to really get into history, you know. When you, um, I was thinking about this as you were talking, you tend to, you know, you have, your career has had both um, films that are focused on particular times or, or um, you know, or um, the after effects of certain things, like say we have um, by another name. Um, but they are, they are all almost always anchored in an individual or groups of individuals, right? So that, that people are telling their stories. So could you talk a little bit about how you um, combine the personal with that sort of historical to create um, audience identification with what's happening? Well, I always believe this, that as a filmmaker, part of my job is to be a good storyteller, right? That's number one. Second part of my job is to tell you good history as I'm telling you that story. The third part of my job is to, how best to do that. And, and from my experience and from my journey, always the best way for me to do that is to find characters that can help bring that story to life. Because to me, if you can connect emotionally to the characters, it can take you through the film. So for example, when Spike and I did Four Little Girls, I remember putting the assembly together after we did this montage where you see, you see the stuff that happened in 63, the people being hosed, the dogs attacking people, people going to jail. So we had to start the first act. So I had said to Spike, we should try to do this interweaving, both a little personal story about each girl and the history of what was going on in Birmingham. So initially I thought, well, maybe we should start with the Birmingham story, set up Birmingham first before we got to the personal stories. So I started to lay it out that way structurally, and I felt like I wasn't getting into the film, you know. So then I said, well, maybe we should start with Denise McNair and how her parents met, you know, how he met his wife, and how they fell in love, and then they had Denise, you know, and she, she grew up and he took her to a five and dime store and it was segregated. She was asking her father, how come they couldn't eat a hamburger with the regular the rest of the, the, rest of the, the rest of the people? To me, that was a personal way to get to the story. And I always liked that. And part of it, you know, quite honestly, you know, comes from me as a young kid watching all these feature films, and they're always character driven. And you're always starting with that personal story. So that became sort of part of my mantra when I, every time I'm trying to tell a story, I'm trying to introduce it to the audience, the historical story, through a personal lens, always. You know, and to me, it's a, it can be a major challenge if you don't have a personal character you can t get attached to. Can you also talk about that with Slavery by Another Name? Because you did that as well. Uh, but exactly. You're, you're looking at characters who were long dead at this point. Right. And so that, that connection that you made as well between the past and the present. Well, what, what Doug, Doug Blackman wrote the book, what he did was he also understood that he wanted to tell a story about what happened after slavery, you know. And he wanted to do it through a personal lens. So he had characters that he created throughout the book that he found as he researched, that he documented to, to tell this historical story. 
one of the characters he had found was this lady whose son had been taken from her, and she didn't know where he was. You know, was he put in peony, peony, You know, was he sent back to prison? Was he sent into the mines? So we found this letter she had written. You know, to the president, and we decided let's open the film with that letter, with her reciting that letter. Let's find a wonderful actress, actor. Let's put her in costume. Let's open the film like that. Make it personal. And that's what we did, you know. So again, it was that thing about the personal story to take you into the history. And as you see that film unfold, how many people have seen that slavery by another name? Anybody seen it? If you haven't, you should see it. It's great. As that story unfolds, every bit of history is prefaced by a personal, personal encounter. Every piece of history. That's what makes it, you know. And we were very fortunate. One of the things that was very interesting about this film is as we were in production, in post-production, Doug Blackman said, you know, what would be interesting is to talk to present-day people who had ancestors, who were either slaveholders or who were the children of people who had been in slavery. And we found some of those people, and we used them to introduce you to the new chap ex chap the chapters in the story. You know? So again, personal story. It all goes back, I always say, the film that really probably touched me the most, that has informed me as a filmmaker, is Orson Welles' Citizen King. All, I didn't know it at the time, but that's the film that informed me. So it opens up with this guy in his mansion, and he dies, and the only thing, the last things out of his mouth is what? Rosebud. <laughs> So years ago, when I edited a film for St. Clair about Langston Hughes, we opened up, St. had went to, to Senegal, and he had shot some stuff on the beach, and I opened up the film with these beach shots, and I went to a typewriter, Langston Hughes died today. <laughs> so I always go back to that rosebud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else do I have? Are, um, can you talk, I want to um, actually, there's a couple things, I have all sorts of things. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your work when, on fiction film as well? I mean, that's mostly, that's all as an editor, right? All as an editor, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, when I was, when I started in the business of Ganjin Hess, besides making that declarative statement, I didn't want to work on black films, the other statement I made is I wanted to be a big time feature film editor. I didn't want to work on documentaries. I didn't even know what documentaries were. I wanted to cut feature films, dramatic films. Yeah. So. You know, fortunately, the editor who, who I worked with after Gajan Hess was also a documentary editor. And he introduced me to the world of documentary and how important a documentary editor was in shaping the story and telling the story and sort of being the director in the editing room. And I thought my feature film thing was way past me, but then I got a chance to work on a horrible, horrible, horrible zombie movie. <laughs> I work like a dog on. I mean, I work seven hours, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. It has to be the worst film ever made. <laughs> terrible script, oh, terrible actors, awful. <laughs> but I got a feature, right? Then I went to California and I worked on another feature, terrible, terrible, terrible feature about boxing with a gentleman named Leon Isaac Kennedy who had done a film called Penitentiary. And it was directed by a buddy of mine who had been an editor who I had worked for, George Bowers. Oh, okay. And that was terrible too. So I said, this feature career may be not work. <laughs> but fortunately, I met Spike. And the thing that I like about working on fiction films, quite honestly, was it gave me an opportunity as an editor to test my creative chops, you know, in terms of evaluating performances by actors, understanding how to build scenes with actors, how to build action sequences, how to build love sequences. And then to, in some cases with Spike in particular, he would do scenes where he'd have the actors improv, which did enable me to use my documentary skills to be able to know how to select the good pieces to put it together. So it was just a good opportunity for me to sort of expand my palette. Because to me as a creative person, it was, it's always been about expanding my palette, not just being locked into doing editing documentaries or editing features. You know, I want to do docs, I want to do features, I want to produce, I want to direct, I want to do everything. I want to be creative. 
To me, that's the, that's the one thing that I think that I've been very lucky having the opportunity since I was 22 to create. I, I didn't understand that word at all before 22. And from 22 on, that's become a very important word to me, create. So do you think, I mean, as you're, as you're thinking about that, because I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of uh, the creative element of it, and also when you're talking about fiction and nonfiction, about that story element, too. So um, do you see that sort of, those sort of set of skills working both ways, you know, that you're, you're basically calling on a, the same set of skills, but sort of telling slightly different stories? Yeah, to me, I'm a storyteller. So I'm a storyteller if it's fiction or if it's nonfiction. Part of my job is to create a story. The, the, the fortunate thing with a fiction film is that you have a script, you have actors, and if the story's decent, the template's there. The documentary, you have to sometimes figure out the story or re, re, reconfigure the story because the original story idea doesn't work. You know, It's like you write a chapter of a book, you say, oh, Maybe the chapter doesn't shouldn't start this way. You got to rethink the chapter. You can do it in fiction films too, but usually there's a template there. So to me, the challenge is to figure out always how to tell a good story. Always. If you got good actors and a good script in a fiction film, it's easier to tell a story. If you don't have good material in a documentary, it's harder. But it's but I, I love that challenge probably even more. How often are you drawn to like with? Um by another name, of including moments of either reenactment or fictional, sort of fictional? You know, it depends on the material. It depends on if I think the material calls for it. I think with slavery, by another name, you know, Doug had created and had found these characters and we wanted to bring them to life, you know, and it was, to me, there was no other way to do it but through reenactments, finding actors, building sets, costuming the actors to, to, to do it. This film here, Two Trains, when we're telling the story of the young white guy searching for Sunhouse and Skip James, as a counterpoint to the story of the people who went down for Freedom Summer, we had all the great Freedom Summer footage. There's a tremendous amount of that footage. But the guys going down, John Fahey and Dick Waterman going to look for these, for these Sunhouse and Skip James, there's no footage. So then we had to figure out how to do that visually. And in this case, if you watch this film, if you get a chance to watch this film, which will probably come out theatrically in May, we did animation. We did animation to, to recreate that journey for those guys, because we had no footage. So, you, you know, depending on what you need. It used to be a time when you did a documentary, you know, you would, you would say, if you didn't have the material, you couldn't make it. But now you, people try to be creative, use their imagination. Um, what about sound? How do you think about sound in terms of uh, historically. I mean, I know that you use, you know, this two trains running, for instance, have, uh, you know, you're using music in a very particular way. But do you think about that when you're um, cutting, putting together a documentary, how sound also gives you the sense of that historical moment? You know, it, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those questions that I can answer in two ways. When we were doing Eyes on the Prize, and we were using archival footage, you know, we saw people marching in Mississippi or in, in Alabama. Henry Hampton, who was the visionary behind Eyes on the Prize, his big rule of thumb with sound was, you never augment the sound other than what's actually there. So if there was people talking, or if there was interviews, or if that was it. You didn't put in any other sound. You didn't put in any cars, you didn't put in any planes. You didn't try to give it more in terms of sound. You tried to stay journalistically, you know, ethical to the material that was there. If you fast forward 10 years later to when I did Four Little Girls, we have a scene where we see the children and young people being hosed and being bit by the dogs and, and being challenged, you know, you know, by the police. In that particular case, Spike and I made the decision to enhance it. So when we were designing the sound for that film, we did have the sound editors add sound to more hoses, more dog bites and yells, you know, screeches from the dogs, barks from the dogs. We enhanced it. Now, was it journalistically 
correct? No. But we were trying to be more artful. So it always depends on how you want to think about the sound and how you want to use it. You know, some films you say, well, I think we need to add these effects to really pull the audience in. Some films you say, well, let's, let's be purist about it. So I always think it depends on the project. You have to adjust your thinking depending on the project you're working on. Everything shouldn't be full of sound effects or full of sound design. Some things should. It depends on the film. Do you think of um, music when you're cutting? Sometimes? Depends on the film. Because it seems it's, like that. Like yeah, the this movie. one, this one here, the two trains, it's all music. Because we had, what we did was, besides having Chris Thomas King, we have Buddy Guy, we have Valerie June, we have the North Mississippi All-Stars. We have all these contemporary musicians performing the music of Sunhouse and Skip James, right? At the same time as you have the original recordings of Sunhouse and Skip James. So we knew that that music was gonna really be sort of the template to unfold throughout the film as we told both of these stories. In Mo' Better Blues, Spike's film, that like first film I cut for Spike, he shot live recording, playback recordings of the musicians playing their songs or mimicking, the actors mimicking the musicians' songs. So we used that. In some cases, there were certain scenes where Spike said, well, I want to use all blues, Miles Davis. I want to use Goodbye Pork Pie Hat, Charles Mingus. I want to use Love Supreme, John Coltrane. So we knew those pieces of music we were going to use. So I would use those as I was cutting. Sometimes when we had a, like a bamboozle that I did for Spike, we didn't wait until, we didn't put music in until after we cut it. Then we had Terrence Blanchard, the composer, come in, look at the cut, and then think about the music he was going to compose. So again, to me as a creative person, never get stuck doing things one way. It always changes. Always changes. Um, I'm going to, I have lots and lots, I have lots of questions, but I will open it up for a second. Yeah. But I have one question before that, yeah. um, which is, up until recently, I'd say until this past Sunday when Moonlight won, um, it seems as though a lot of the films that we're getting that get that have African American stories, right? Mm -hmm. African American director, possibly, but you know some sort of story that mm -hmm. mostly African American films, mm -hmm. tended to be films that um, were set in a historical moment rather than a contemporary moment. Moonlight was. That's what I say. Except for except yeah. for Moonlight, but um, you know, in the, you think of Twelve Years of Slave or um, Hidden Figures, Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. or Fences is a sort of weird one with that. But um, mm -hmm. even going back, what, what um, uh, which one? Selma. Selma, mm -hmm. so on. So, is it that? And I, this is a big question. I don't, I don't even know if there's an answer to it again because now Moonlight has changed this. But um, that there that for um, the Academy or for bigger budget, not big, big budget, because a lot of these are big, big budget films, but um, that there's something about African American history, you know, African American stories in the past that seems to get more funding than more contemporary. Is that a clear mm, question? I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, I think that all of these films probably have particular kind of engines that made them happen. So let's say, for example, Don Cheadle doing Miles Ahead, Don Cheadle was a movie star. Don Cheadle had to really work hard to get that film fundraised and get it done. You know, so he was able to get it out there. Is it a period piece? Sure, but it's, Miles is still sort of contemporary to a lot of this. Fences is based on a phenomenal play by August. Denzel had done the play. Scott Rudin said, read this play. He decided to do the play. Then he said, okay, let's do the film. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's hard to, you know, to understand how Hollywood works. <laughs> Quite honestly, it really is hard. I mean, you know, you know, I'm not sure it's, they, they're, they're bankrolling films because there's, there's a historical thing there that they say they can handle. You know, I think that it depends on who you talk to. You know, that's a hard question to me. To yeah, answer. Just, you know, because I was thinking of it in terms of, you know, that the idea around Barack Obama, for instance, that we're in a post-racial moment. Well, that, that's, that's you know. not true. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't true even when he was president. Right, right. That, that, you know, history stopped back when you know, the civil rights was well, you know, it, better. Well, I mean, I'll just say this. When it comes to documentaries, 
people who will fund documentaries about the African American experience are always, it's always easier for them to hold on to it when it's historical, when it's 20 years behind, you know, <laughs> in the past. So let's think of it now. When did hip hop start? In the 70s, right? Late 60s, early 70s. Now, people will be thinking, I could do, the, Netflix has a whole documentary series about hip hop revolution, right? Because it was 20 some years ago. Over thirty years ago now, so it's history. It's 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 viable. You know, you can digest it easier now. You know, and that's sort of how documentaries work. You need something to to move along historically. It's like when Stanley did his Black Panthers film. People have been trying to do that film for years, but now the Panthers was the Panther story is over thirty years old. Now you can do it. You know, so a documentary sometimes it takes a long period of time for people to say, "Oh, we should do it." Except for communism. Oh, like no. <laughs> um, and I, I do want to um, give you a shout out for Style Wars. Style Wars. You cut in what, 82? I was a co editor in 1982. Okay, so, mm -hmm. okay, so we'll open it up. Um, so, just speaking of what you just said, um, what about the 13th? Ava the Finance one? Yeah. What, what do you want me to say about it? Do you think it's a historical film? It's a film on the press? I think it's both. I think I think Ava does her. She she lays down what I call a historical backdrop of why we have mass incarceration, and then she 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 brings it to the present. Yeah, I think it's both. You know, I think it's relevant. And you know? now your neighbor? Oh, that's a mind blower. That's <laughs> that's phenomenal. I mean, I think. I think anyone who hasn't seen that film, that's that's like that should be mandatory yes. in every film in every school, in the English department, the history department. It should be mandatory. Because that's I mean, to listen to James Baldwin speak truth to power back in the sixties and to know how relevant it is today, it's phenomenal. It's in the theaters now. Yeah. And they didn't get the Oscar. The the Oscar. They didn't get the Oscar. No. I'd, I'd say that I'd, I'd like, you know, I would like showing, if I were doing this in a class, showing Slavery by Another Name and then the 13th, because I think Slavery by Another Name actually lays the groundwork for that. You're going to do the work. Yes, John. I, I, I two questions. I, I was thinking about a mixing of genres and, and uh, a film like Get Out, which I have to admit, I, I haven't seen yet. I've been reading lots about it, but I, what I understand, it mixes yeah. horror genres with humor and social commentary. And I wonder if you, if you see a kind of opening there uh, for African American filmmakers and actors uh, to well, mix genres in ways that haven't been done before, right? In the film. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's actually not as strictly historical. No, but it made $30 million, so it is an opening. <laughs> it makes $30 right, million dollars the first weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it opens. I haven't seen it yet either. I'm planning yeah. to see it this weekend. Yeah. And I think if if Jordan P Jordan Peele, Jordan Peele. Mm -hmm. if he can make that film a blockbuster, make it make money, then it, it will open some opportunities to 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 bend the genres in a way that he has done. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just add to that, I on top of everything that you've just said, do you have any specific advice for? Young filmmakers, students in the audience, uh, who are either thinking about making films, making documentaries, or uh, want to find a way to combine an interest with with history, with I'd say, world, I'd creative say, ways. I say two things. I say be dedicated and understand you have to learn your craft, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to understand you have to persevere, you know, because because making films and particularly documentary films. It's not about making money. It's about dedication and a passion for the history and believing the importance of the history and that it should be out there. And then also for you as the person who wants to get that history out there, mm -hmm. you figure out how to do it in very creative and unique mm -hmm. ways, like what Rob Peck did with I'm Not Your Neighbor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. We talk about the funding of these sorts of things. Um, because of the nature of the work that you do, it's hard to Working with a young um, doctor, documentary filmmaker and trying to help her raise money for it. It just is a never ending slog. Um, and you've skirted around that a little bit. Um, I so that, you yeah, asked me directly. Yeah, I had a sort of direct conversation about those of us who believe in um, 
films about black people, about the black experience, whether it's um, fiction or whether it's historical fiction or whether it is documentary, how can we help move forward the support, the financial support for um, this endeavor, these endeavors? I'll say question, to, but. no. It's, I, I, I articulate it this way to you. I'm I'm 66 years old. I still make documentaries, and I still it still takes a lot of time to raise the funds. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'm co-directing a documentary with a young man now about this organization Acorn. Remember Acorn? Mm -hmm. right. Very important story. It's taken us three and a half years to get the funds raised. And to finally get that film almost finished, we are, we're going to be we're going to be in the Tribeca Film Festival this year, right? For three and a half years, he's not making much money. I just, I just gave my salary to the production, you know, because we felt the story is important, and we applied to all the different funding sources, you know, ITVS, the Ford Foundation, you know, Sundance Documentary Fund, the Pere Lorenz Fund, the Inter International Documentary Association. And we were able to cobble pieces of money together. That's what you do, right? Here's the other side of the spectrum. There's a, two young men up in upstate New York who did a documentary a few years ago called The Throwaways about life and for the black community and the community of color in Albany. Those guys made that film by hook or by crook, you know, dimes, cents, pennies. Then they had this idea they wanted to do a documentary about a community in Florida that all black community primarily, and it has a unique situation where a lot of those young men, black men who came out of the community become major football players. They play in the NFL, they become, this, this town grows these football players, but the town struggles with crime and poverty and all that other stuff. Now those guys, they started a GoFund, I think they raised 7,000 bucks. 7,000, not much. You know, they wanted to go out and shoot. I said, guys, how much is it gonna cost you to go out and shoot? They said, well, we need 1,500 bucks. I gave them 1,500 bucks, you know. I gave them 1,500 bucks three times, <laughs> you know. Just so those guys would go out and shoot. Now, they, sh they were able to shoot the footage, small crew. Now they need money for post-production. Now we were talking on the phone when I was coming here and I was telling him what he needs to do. He maybe should start building the rough assembly, you know because it may take them another year and a half to get funds to raise that, 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 get that film done. I'm saying all this to say to you that it's never easy getting these films funded. Even somebody like Spike, mm -hmm. when he did, what's the one he did about the vamp, the his Gajan has remake? Uh, Sweet, Blood of Jesus. Sweet Blood of Jesus. He was able to raise a million because he was Spike on uh, Kids Kickstarter. Oh. It's never easy to raise funds for these films about people of color in history. It's never easy. I've been doing it for 40 years. It's never easy. But does it, do I get frustrated? Do I get depressed? Sure, but I don't know any other way. I just keep going. But Mr. Porter, I yes. think, uh, you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not your Negro was, uh, uh, the money come from different countries in Europe. And it took him like 15 years to get yeah. right for yeah. yeah, because in Europe, they have a lot more funds. And, and Raul is a, you know, he's French Haitian filming. Can you mention also that, um, well, it seems as though everything's getting cheaper because the cameras are smaller, but there's still a real, there's still a real cost mm -hmm. to making film? Yeah, it's always a cost. I mean, listen, you're right. You don't have to shoot film anymore. You can shoot with this young man is shooting here, the <laughs> iPhone. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to shoot the footage, but you still have to figure out how to edit the footage, how to get it online and color corrected, how to get it mixed, you know. You can do all those things cheaply, in a cheaper way than we used to, but it still costs money. It still costs, it doesn't cost the kind of money that it used to cost, it still costs money. But, if you believe in your project, if you believe that it's an important film that needs to be out there for people to, to see, you will get it done. It's like a young lady, six weeks, four weeks ago, flew all the way from Los Angeles to come to meet me at NYU to spend three hours with me in the editing room going over a film called The Poison City about pollution in Detroit. And not Detroit, in uh, Flint. She shot all this footage in Flint, Michigan. She's, she's 
dedicated to making this film. So I said to her, I will spend half a day with you going through your assembly, giving you some, some, some ideas and direction. I did. Four hours I spent with her. When I see people who are dedicated to wanting to tell those stories, I will give them my time. You don't have to pay me, I will give them my time because the one thing I learned from that man, Victor Konevsky, who was the editor, who taught me, from St. Clair Bourne, who taught me, from George Bowers, who taught me, that I had a responsibility not only to tell our stories, but to take my knowledge and to pass it on. That's, I can't take it with me when I go. I'm supposed to pass it on. Yes, sir. What do you have to say to a minority, uh, to a minority filmmaker coming to play to break into a, into a predominantly white, white Hollywood industry? I say you got to be diligent, dedicated, <laughs> and you got to fight tooth and nail to make your voice heard. You have to. You know, you have to, you have to be very proactive. To make it in film, to make it in the creative voice, you gotta be proactive. You have to be able to go out there and pitch yourself, you know, and to be upfront about what you wanna do. I mean, I knew at 26, I just didn't wanna be an editor in a dark room. I wanted more. So I was aggressive. I started to become more aggressive. I built up my confidence. It's the same thing. I mean, Spike is, Spike is a great example. That guy is hell on wheels. I have a second question, actually. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the rise of more inclusive um, television shows and movies, such as, uh, such as, um, such as like Creed and Luke Cage, for example? Uh, I'm just curious what you think of uh, television and, movie and media in general becoming much more inclusive and minority. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's cool. I think it's good. I mean, I don't think Luke Cage is also great story writing, but I think it's good. <laughs> I think it's important. Yeah, I do. I mean, Creed. That's a good film. That's a great film. What's the name? What's it? Ryan Cooper, right? Yeah. yeah. He's a good filmmaker. That guy's a good filmmaker. See, that, that to me is, that's, that's a very smart filmmaker. Let's go back to what this gentleman said. Here's a filmmaker who takes the Rocky Van franchise, flips it on his head, and he made it work. Wow. He was right. He made it work. That was a good film. Did I answer your question about funding? <laughs> <We'll talk later>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Miss. Um, I just want to number one, thank you very much for all all the work that you provided to us. And thank I can show eyes on the prize every yeah. semester for the rest of my career. It's so fantastic. Yeah. I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit about your your latest film and some of the challenges involved in trying to do to work with musicians and uh, just a little bit more about, two about the process of the two trains. Yeah. You know, that was a filmmaker. The, the gentleman who was the producer, writer, Ben and Dean, he approached me about three and a half years ago, and he said he wanted to do this film about the search for Sunhouse and Skip James. I said, that sounds cool. Then he said, well, I also, also want to interweave Freedom Summer. And I said, well, that's not so cool. Because <laughs> that's kind of hard to do. I don't think, I don't think you, we're up to that. But he was very, the one thing about novices, <laughs> they don't know, they don't know any, they don't have any rules. And he was, he was dedicated to that idea. And at first I was reluctant, second time I was reluctant, third time I was reluctant. By the fourth, fifth time I said, okay, maybe, maybe I can figure it out. And we, we assembled a wonderful team, myself, Ben, and the editor, David Winsnet, and we started that journey. And the first shoot we did, because and we we started we tried to raise some money, but we got we got no, mm -hmm. we got no funding at all. But this guy, this guy who never produced a documentary in his life, somehow, I don't know if he's connected. <laughs> when I mean connected, I mean connected. He raised every dime that afforded us to be able to go on the shoots. He could pay me to go on the shoots. He could hire a crew. He could pay for our travel. So our first shoot, we went out to L.A. and we interviewed, we shot Lucinda Williams. Now, before we had to interview Lucinda Williams, we had to go to the bar the night before and drink for like three hours with Lucinda, because she likes to drink, just to get her oiled. And then the next day, it took us two hours before she would sit down and even talk and play. 
But we decided that we were going to shoot live performances with all these musicians at the same time as we're going to interview people also about the history. So we first did Lucinda Williams, then we did, we went to New Orleans, we did Chris Thomas King, then we went to San Francisco, and we did some of the white guys who went down south. Then we went down to Mississippi, Jackson, Miss Jackson, Mississippi, for the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, and interviewed a bunch of those people for Freedom Summer. Then we went to Chicago to do Buddy Guy. Then we went to Austin, Texas, to do Gary Clark Jr. So it was constantly interviews, performances, and we shot all the performances with two cameras. You know, we shot them all with two cameras because the technology is so efficient now and cheaper, you can do that. And then we shot for like a year and a half before we even went to the editing room. Then we spent almost a year in the editing room, just editing. And this guy, Ben, raised every dime. And when we decided to do the animation with this company in Sweden, Apparel, we had to, he had to pay them a lot of money. He must, he must have debt, <laughs> so much debt. <laughs> it's amazing. So you don't ask? <laughs> I didn't ask. Lazi, Lazi gave me the check. I didn't ask. Wow, the clip is fast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this one, this one played the New York Film Festival. Oh, okay. Acorns. Acorns, right. And you know, we talk about Maynard. Maybe Jackson. Yeah, that, that's you're you're in the process of posting that. Right? Yeah, about uh, two years ago, Maynard Jackson. By the Maynard Jackson is besides Mr. Lewis. Yes. Yeah, the first black oh, man yeah. of Atlanta. His family approached me, which you should always be a little. As a filmmaker, you should always be a little suspect when the family approaches you. Mm -hmm. But the family approached me. His son, Maynard Jr., and his wife, who's a producer, they wanted to do a documentary about Maynard. And uh, I read their sort of idea. I came up with my own. I did some research. I knew about Maine, but I did some more research. And I decided <laughs> this is, it's about time that there's a story be, be done about Maine. But we had to struggle to raise the money. I mean, we did a, they were able to raise the money for the first set of interviews about a year and a half ago. We interviewed Andy, Andrew Young and Joseph Lowry and Vernon Jordan and Al Sharpton. Then they ran out of money. They ran out of money. So I went down to Atlanta for a few meetings. We met with the public television station down there to get their support. I met with Coca-Cola to get their support. Still struggled to raise the money. It took about another year before, like last, this past November, they were able to raise another chunk of money for me to go down and shoot 10 interviews. Then all of a sudden they seemed to get some more money. Then I went back to Atlanta in January and did 13 interviews. And then they had raised some more money and I went back a month ago to DC and did five interviews. So all of a sudden they were able to start to raise some money. So now we're starting, we're starting to assemble the material, but we're gonna do some more shooting in the spring. And hopefully, I mean, every, the other thing I find is that sometimes pe you know, people who are novices, they have the big dream. So the big dream for the family now is that this film will be in Sundance or go to Toronto, you know. <laughs> And I never say, I never be, uh, what's that What's that word? I ne I'm not a naysayer. I, I, I sometimes would say, guys, wake <laughs> up. But I didn't say that. I said, if you want it, let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, because everybody wants to dream. Yeah, I was hoping that, uh, you know, in the, in, in the interest of a, 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 a woman's well-being and achievement, I thought that. I was reading, where's the politics of Hollywood coming from to celebrate the achievement of women in hidden figures? Uh, the New York Times ran a whole series on the uh, uh, the raising of uh, black and brown or mass with white hidden figures get such nominations and or acknowledgments. Where, where, where's that politics come from? Well, I think it's politics of the culture of the country we live in. Yeah. It's a country that, I mean, think of it. Right think of, around the platform of uh, but, but, that this and women. But know, think of it this way. I mean, I'm, and other people. I've been around 66 years. I didn't know this story. I didn't know this story. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this story. This yeah. is a fantastic story. It's a great story. You know, it's again speaking to the, you know, what the country, what the culture puts out there for us to see, you know. Or show how the lives of people have to be so empty and in vain and in, and with the vain, you know, of uh, uh, 
blessing other people now, and we bring second legion. Yeah. With their frustration. You see, you see, you see who get themselves together. You see who's our president. Yeah. That would be interesting to do a piece on that. His uncle John Trump. He was a good. He was a physics teacher for decades over at MIT. He was. And opening the doors for other people and women. His uncle was? was his uncle, yes. <laughs> yeah, I met him at a science conference back in 78, New York Academy of Sciences. So I asked what he thought of him. He said, no, sir. Let's show him. I've been trying to formulate this question, but I have to go back to John Franklin talking about threads. <coughs> and you're talking about leaving enough of the black story in the American history story. So a couple threads, I'm not sure how they come together. But um, having to do with, when you're pitching a, pitching a, a story, and you're hitting that resistance. How much of that resistance is um, often because of your identity? How much is it because the story isn't of interest to the people with the money? And how much of it is because they think the audience is going to be too small? Um, so that's taking me to the, the other question, the, the observation I had about Don Cheadle, Miles Davis, Ryan Gosling, La La Land. Who do you want us in this country? Who's going to teach us about jazz? Don Cheadle using Miles Davis or Ryan Gosling telling us what jazz is. And I think you know the, the audience. The audience problem. I think is the real problem. Uh, and it goes back to what are our big civil rights movies? The ones that get the, the blockbuster always have the white guys being the facilitators to tell the white audience this story that is so important. That we should but I don't know, maybe, maybe, uh, You answered your own question. I guess I don't know. There's a question in there. Um, you answered your own question. There's a threat. There's, but it's, it's always that. But the, the first thing to remember, the first thing you said was that I would respond to a different way. That to me, black history is American history. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that to me is like, that's it, yep. as far as I'm concerned. Yep. The problem is, think about, you know, in this day and age, the 21st century, when I was doing my documentary about August Wilson, I would ask some of my students where I teach at NYU, how many of you have heard of August, or heard of August Wilson? Mm -hmm. I didn't have any hands go up. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? No hands go up. If you ask them, some of those kids, how many of you have heard of F. Scott Fitzgerald or Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. hands would go up. So, so it's, it's that constant ignorance and, and lack of education to understand that American history is not just Tennessee Williams or F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, or Ernest Hemingway or John Grisham, you know. You know, it's Richard Wright, it's Ralph Ellison, you know, it's Maya Angelou, it's, it's American history. It is that black people with this American history. So, that's the part of it. So when you named all those three things, Hollywood thinks there's not enough money. It thinks that if a black main character is the lead, they ain't going to make any money. All those things. And you're right. How in the world, and you tell us, what's that name of that article? The Unbearable what? Whiteness? Yeah, the Unbearable Whiteness of Blah, Blah, Blah. <laughs> if you think about it, you ask yourself, they showed the clip at the Oscars the other night of Ryan Gosling explaining the improvisation to Emma Stone. I thought, what are you kidding? You know, Don Cheadle playing Miles. With all his flaws, with all, all his flaws, flaws is more relevant than that. But you know, it's amazing here. Here we are in 2017, and it makes me think, Jesus, man, in 1968, I thought there would be some, there would be an opening here where things would be a little clearer. But sometimes I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I want to say this one thing, though. I know we're talking about John Hope Franklin. I was very fortunate in 1990 to meet John Hope Franklin. I went down to Duke to interview him because his father had been an attorney named Buck Franklin, who had been involved in helping the African-American community that had been really subjugated to white you know, dominance at the Tulsa race riots. So I, I was doing research for a PBS documentary about the Tulsa race riots. The film became, was called Going Back to T-Town. And part of my research was to go down and interview Buck, uh, John Franklin, who was about five or six years old when those riots happened, to talk about his father 
and I thought he was the most elegant, wonderful, intelligent man. You know, just spending a couple hours with him was one of the high points of my, my life. On that note, does anyone have questions? But um, it was criticized because it wasn't filmic enough. It wasn't. It was too much like you were watching the stage play. It was. It was. There were too many long speeches, and uh, I just. I don't know. I just wondered what you thought of that as a, as a translation, of uh, of theater to film. Well. I think I'm going to take the fifth on that okay, one. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take the fifth on okay. that one. Not this public audience today. I, I won't say anything. Oh, right. yeah. There's one more. There's a hand up there. Do you want one more? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Um, so we kind of touched on, like, obviously what you thought of, like, misrepresentation of, like, black culture in um, media and movies and all the types of genres. but. Like, what about misrepresentation of, like, other minority groups? Like, you know, I mean, like, we used to have movies, like, when movies started, we used to have, like, white people and blackface playing black people and getting awards for that. Yeah, white and, people playing Chinese people. Yeah. Right, right, and, like, sure. now we have uh, able-bodied people playing, you know, disabled <laughs> roles or yeah. um, straight people playing gay roles or uh cisgender people playing transgender roles and we have a lot of misrepresentation with that like um uh that movie that just came out uh about the guy who plays a transgender uh what movie is this? something redford or something whatever but um yeah the data yeah. show sorry um oh, anyway. like yeah we have a lot of like misrepresentation of other minorities and i'm just wondering like do you feel the need to ever like go into topic about that? I think that if, if you as a creative person, if you can find people that represent what you're trying to do in those films, you should, and those people are transgender or whatever, they should, you should be able to use those people. I mean, I just think that sometimes we get narrow, narrowly focused on who we think we can cast for a movie. So you got to open up your mind. I mean, some filmmakers can, some creative people can, some can't. I mean, you got to challenge that 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 you know assumption all the time. You always have to challenge that assumption. Yeah. So I agree with you. Yeah. I want to. Yes. You mentioned uh, you got some of your training and experience through PBS mm -hmm. uh, in the early days, and now that. Speaking of the political climate, and we're facing not only budget cuts, but maybe existential threats to arts funding and programs like that that formerly created, or at least helped to create, a pipeline for African Americans and other minorities. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts about what we can do at a place like Brooklyn College, aside from the fact that CUNY also has faced budget cuts in the recent past, but uh, in humanities departments and maybe uh, even in disciplines uh, that not necessarily traditionally considered to be creative, um, if it's a matter of incorporating, you know, documentary films or other, or music or other types of things into humanities classrooms or, you know, what, what steps we can take to help encourage um, Be you know, vocal, write letters, get on the phone. Call, call, the, call your congressman. Get on the phone. Call people. It's like when they were trying to confirm Betsy the Post. I got on the phone and said, "No, you can't." Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta get on the phone. You gotta be active. You, know, you gotta be more active than ever now. In this political. I want to thank you all. Thank you.